at the Wellington Boat Sheds, crews of the four universities are getting their boats down to the water, ready to compete in the race for the Hebery Shield. Auckland supporters are in good form. But it's Canterbury that has the best boat. Right from the start of the course across Oriental Bay, Canterbury takes the lead. Canterbury wins. Second, where are they? Otago. Third, Auckland. And Victoria somewhere out in the harbour. For the 47th annual regatta at Naro Wahia, old time Maori canoes once again race down the Waikato. Canoe events are an outstanding feature of this regatta, reviving memories of the river's warlike past. When it comes to dancing, the women folk can show their traditional skill. And that includes the comedy turn by the fat lady. An exhibition of aquaplaning caters for modern tastes. If you find the aquaplane too tame, the devil plane will give you quite a turn. Most popular event of the day is the canoe hurdle race. Putting their steeds over the sticks calls for good teamwork by the jockeys. The diving under technique adds another hazard, for scrambling aboard again without capsizing takes a bit of doing. Coming ashore today are the English wives of New Zealand airmen. 65 of our men are bringing home their brides. And 20 of them bring families as well. Proud fathers carry their offspring ashore in the latest portable bassinets. When they left New Zealand, they never bargained on this, but right now they can't think of a better homecoming. Showing off their bright-eyed babies means more to them than their deeds in the air. At the clearing station, the newest New Zealanders line up for a press photograph. Next day, another ship arrives, bringing more brides and babies. Again, Air Force wives are in the majority, but Army and Navy are represented as well. These arrivals are acting as a sort of reverse lend-lease, offsetting the population trends caused by our American allies. Once again, it's the family reunion, the husband in civvies and the shy feeling towards the in-laws. But everywhere, people are trying to say, welcome to your new homeland. This meat at the Wellington Abattoirs is almost ready for the market. All it's waiting for is to be standardized or graded. Every piece of this meat when it's sold will have on it this red line, which means it's first grade meat. This is its grading mark, its mark of quality which protects the buyer. This does not mean you can buy only one kind of meat, but it plainly tells you which kind you're buying. In every butcher's shop hangs a chart which tells the housewife what grade the Sunday joint is. A red line for first grade and other colors for other grades. And it's the same with other goods. In furniture buying, for instance, you can be guided this way too. Here's a woman out to buy a chair. She wants a good chair, so she closely examines this one. Underneath the seat, there's a standard mark that tells her it's first grade quality. Looking at other furniture, she finds the same mark at the bottom of a drawer or in the back of a wardrobe. It means this furniture is good furniture. Here in this factory, a chair is receiving a standard mark. While it might have been made in any style, it's pleasing in design. Good materials have gone to its making, and it's well constructed. To an expert, there's a lot of difference between these two chairs. With footwear, it's the same. There's a standard mark that tells you the quality of the shoes you're buying. The quality of footwear has been standardized, but this does not mean there's only one style or one design. Standardization does not restrict your choice. 
It means that an expert guarantees the quality of the goods. The standard mark is not a trademark nor a slogan. It's an indication of quality. It protects you when you buy. It was in July 1939 that I first met Franklin Roosevelt in his own home at Hyde Park, just north of New York. It was there in his library, into which he came with his chair, the wheeled chair that he'd only been able to get about in for years. And it was there that he told me that if trouble came, as he thought it would, and New Zealand and the democracies of the South Pacific were menaced, he wouldn't let that danger go without taking some steps to prevent it or avoid it or remove it. It was there that he said that America wouldn't see the cousins down in the South Pacific left continuously in danger. You know how he has kept that promise. Another occasion was at the White House when we were discussing on what subject could the United Nations be brought together to reach reasonable agreement? And he said, what about food? That seemed a subject upon which all could agree, making enough food available to everyone. That was the origin of the conference that was held at Hot Springs to find out whether there was enough resources in the world to provide the food that everybody ought to have. Because, as he said, half the people of the world never had enough to eat, never had had enough to eat, irrespective of war. I question whether the passing of any man could brought more feeling and sorrow than the passing of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Great, humble, quiet, tenacious and courageous, he did what had to be done irrespective of the cost of doing it when it was necessary. It's difficult at any time to say that the passing of any man means an irreparable loss, but if that term can ever be used, it can be used in connection with the passing of the late president. Franklin Roosevelt gave his life to help to hold and extend freedom. Let us ensure his memorial by carrying on till the conflict is over. Thank you.